I am honored to introduce our keynote today, who is Mr. TV Narendran, who is the CEO and Managing Director of Tata Steel Limited. Uh, just for some quick background, as the Managing Director, Mr. Narendran successfully led uh, Tata Steel's Greenfield expansion. He also has over 32 years of experience in the mining and metals industry. And uh, when we originally reached out to Mr. Narendran's team to have him keynote, um, on the topic of ethical leadership, without any hesitation, this all came together in, in a matter of weeks, and he made himself available to talk to us um, on this important topic. Tata Steel is also one of the few Indian companies that have kept this place as a nine-time world's most ethical companies, um, and they've always been embedded in these important conversations happening around the globe. So with that, welcome, Mr. Narendran, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Aarti. Uh, thank you for having me in the session. My privilege uh, to be here. Uh, yes, uh, we've been recognized for, our, you know, by the Atisphere Institute. We've also been one of the founding members of uh, the Business Ethics Leadership Alliance uh, for South Asia since 2017. So when the subject came up, I said, I'm happy to talk about it. It's something we really believe in and we obviously try to practice uh, all the time. Uh, Obviously, uh, you know, this is something which is core to the Tata Group, to Tata Steel. Uh, we go by the byline leadership with trust. Uh, Tata Steel was set up, uh, you know, more than 100 years back, 113 years to be precise. And uh, one of the foundations on which uh, the group at Tata Steel was built uh, uh, was articulated by the founding fathers as, uh, you know, uh, the philosophy of saying that the community is not just another stakeholder, but the very purpose uh, of our existence. So, you know, so that's the ethos with which uh, this company has been built. Uh, and in many ways, Tata Steel and uh, the city where it all started, Jamshedpur, which is named after the founder of the Tata Group, epitomizes a lot of the value system that we, uh, uh, you know, try to practice. So, uh, uh, so this is something very core to us, very important to us, uh, and uh, very much uh, part of our DNA. But uh, having said that, uh, it's not just that uh, it's uh, a good value system to have. I think it makes sense in multiple ways. If you want to look at it uh, from, uh, is there a business case for it? Well, that may not be the reason why you do it. But uh, certainly there are good business reasons uh, for being an ethical and, and uh, a high integrity uh, organization. Uh, you know, uh, to start with, uh, it helps people trust. Uh, and uh, as organizations grow organically and inorganically in the geographies that you're present, in the geographies you're not present, it becomes very important. Tata Steel in India operates in some of the poorest parts of the country, some of the more challenging parts of the country because of the uh, poverty around us. So you need to build trust to the communities there before you go and build factories or start doing mining operations and things like that. And uh, having a reputation of being a high integrity organization certainly helps uh, open doors for us, builds relationships for us. I'm not uh, uh, saying that we were perfect in everything that we did, but even if we made mistakes, uh, people trusted us to correct ourselves and do what is right. And it's not just in India. When uh, over 15 years back, we stepped outside the shores of India to acquire companies overseas. We first went to Singapore. Uh, in fact, uh, I went there and worked there for five years when we acquired the company there. Uh, we then went to Thailand, we went to Europe, and uh, I'm talking of 2005, 2006, 2007, when there were not so many Indian companies uh, acquiring uh, companies overseas. And every time our reputation preceded us and uh, gave people a lot of comfort, uh, because uh, otherwise, uh, you know, even when we first went to Singapore, there was anxiety about how will an Indian company run a Singaporean uh, company and... Uh, Will the value systems be aligned and uh, will we be responsible corporate, so on and so forth. And uh, again, here, uh, having a reputation uh, which precedes you certainly helps. Uh, and then, of course, it's up to you to build the trust, uh, uh, you know, on the opportunities that you've created uh, for yourself. Secondly, it obviously attracts the right kind of employees that you want, uh, you know, the right kind of suppliers, the right kind of vendors, partners, joint venture partners, and so on and so forth. So. Everyone knows pretty much what they're signing up to. And I think if there's an alignment of value systems, it's much easier to build relationships and long-term relationships uh, as well. So there are a number of reasons why you tend to attract the right kind of people and the right kind of partners. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously that is something which, uh, again, helps uh, uh, 
if you're an ethical and a, a, a company which is high integrity. The third part is we are in the metals and mining space. It's a fairly highly regulated place, space, particularly the mining side of it. And we deal a lot with the governments at the local level, at the districts, at the states, at the center. And again here, uh, you know, and again with the communities as well. Uh, so the fact that you have a reputation certainly helps. A few years back, uh, because of a number of problems that the industry, the mining industry was having as a whole, the Supreme Court stepped in and closed all the mines and uh, told the government and the industry that you please clean up your act in terms of at least all the approvals that you need to have in place. Because oftentimes the industry had applied for approvals, the governments had uh, allowed you to continue in a deemed approval basis. And so the Supreme Court said, sorry, please clean it up and then get started. And so for the first time in 100 years, the mines were closed. And when we were working with the governments to get them open, uh, one of the uh, one of the pleasant surprises we had was the local governments were very happy to talk to us and our minds were amongst the first to be opened because there was no concern from the government side that if they do something with us that uh, people will uh, uh, accuse them of doing something wrong or uh, you know uh, favoring somebody because obviously we worked in a very co a very collaborative way to find solutions uh, you know which was uh, as per the uh, guide guidances of the Supreme Court and uh, which protected the interests of the government and was also fair to industry. So it helps you find those solutions, uh, particularly when you uh, are working uh, with the government and they trust you to do what is right, uh, you know, not just what is self-serving, but what is right. But having said all that, it's not easy, obviously. Uh, a large number of small things need to be done to ensure that your reputation is there. And uh, it takes a long trust and reputation takes a long time to build and can get lost uh, overnight. Uh, it's also important to codify it. Uh, you know, the Tata Group has been uh, practicing this for more than 100 years, but we formally codified it maybe about 25 years back. There's a Tata Code of Conduct, not because you didn't know what to do, but 90% of the time you knew exactly what to do. But when you're operationalizing it, when you're communicating it to people down the line, it's good to have something which is documented. And uh, more so now when you have the anti-bribery and anti-corruption policies around the world, which you're trying to follow, then there's a greater need to codify things so that it is not open to interpretation at different levels. And depending on the context that you're in, you don't interpret it as per your convenience. So there is a need to codify it. There's a need to train people on it. There's a need to do assessments and audit audits on it so that you ensure that it's not just uh, good thoughts and uh, you know uh, allowing everyone to uh, exercise a moral compass, but about a set of uh, 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 you know, uh, do's and don'ts, which is available to everyone and consistently deployed. Again, uh, your value system is uh, demonstrated by how you behave when you're under pressure. And when there's pressure to not follow that value system, how do you behave? And even oftentimes at enormous cost to the company, you need to stick to the value system if you really believe in it. It is also not just about the leadership demonstrating it. Obviously, that's a minimum condition. The leaders have to be the role models, but it is also about people down the line. Because ultimately, most people who deal with the company deal with people down the line. They don't deal with the leaders, right? So there are many touch points for all the stakeholders who deal with the company. And uh, those uh, stakeholders will judge the company by how the touch points behave. So it could be somebody at the gate of your factory. It could be somebody in procurement. It could be somebody uh, in the front end. Or it could be somebody who's uh, doing a safety assessment in your factory or whatever. So there are multiple touch points. And there is a need to consistently demonstrate that the value system that you profess is what you're practicing uh, down the line. And in the current environment, as organizations grow across geographies and in an environment where we are dependent more on a virtual uh, connect, it's uh, even more critical to be careful in how we build this culture. Having said that, going forward in a current environment, why has this become more and more important? Uh, first is, as I said, the policies and regulatory environment is changing. ABAC policies are there. And if you're a multinational company, uh, I think all the more reason why you ensure that across all geographies you consistently deploy it. Uh, the second is, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is a growing view from people outside of the corporate system that corporates are self-serving, are untrustworthy, there's a large section of society who's very, very suspicious about corporates and uh, how they operate. And there is a need for corporates across the world to build this trust uh, with these stakeholders so that uh, we are seen as uh, obviously there is a commitment to the shareholder, but there are, there's also a commitment we demonstrate uh, to the communities and to the whole ecosystem uh, that we operate in. 
And uh, in a globalized environment, as I explained earlier, uh, you may not have the luxury to let people experience you, to build trust with you. Your reputation precedes you. The trust, you start building the trust even before people start experiencing you. And uh, that's very important as well. And last but not the least, uh, capital markets are also watching this carefully. Uh, you know, uh, funds are uh, people who own, who have the capital and are using the financial sector to invest in companies are also laying down conditions on what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. So I close my uh, uh, speech with this. I'm open to some Q&A, but I just wanted to highlight that it's not just a nice thing to have, but I think it's very, very important to have the right culture in today's day and age. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you for that, Mr. Narendran. Um, you raised a lot of important points and I would like to zero in um, on one particular point where you mentioned trust and reputation. Um, how has your role as a business leader elevated since the pandemic or, or the lockdown in India? So, you know, uh, uh, when the pandemic hit us, it hit us first in Europe and then in India in some sense. Uh, again, uh, people watch uh, for your reaction. Are you planning well to make sure that the employees are taken care of? Right. Are you only considering what's important for the business? You know, are you putting your employees at risk? So, you know, so your actions uh, matter a lot. Secondly, particularly in India, like I said, we operate in some of the poorest parts of the country. We run the only hospitals there are in those parts of the country, right? So people look at us for the community response. Mm -hmm. So we had to move very fast to respond to the needs of the community. We had to move very fast to take care of our employees. And obviously, we had to also, wherever the customers were operating, and there was uh, it was not a complete lockdown. Like in Europe, it was not a complete lockdown. In India, our customers were also closed, but in Europe, our customers were open. So we needed to make sure that we were also serving our customers uh, despite uh, all these challenges. Uh, and we have a very, very uh, strong CSR team which works and they went out. And to me, uh, you know, in our hospitals, our doctors were putting themselves at risk, obviously, to mm -hmm. deal with patients. Our CSR teams were putting themselves at risk to go and deal with the community. So I think the whole entire employee base, uh, you know, kind of uh, signed up to uh, do whatever was right for the company because they trusted the company to not do something which was wrong for them. Mm -hmm. So I think really. Uh, tested the trust that the employees have in you, the community has in you, and uh, that puts more responsibility on the leadership to make sure that the trust is not breached. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just moving on to, to another question here before we wrap, how has the change to a virtual setting really impact what you do day to day? Well, uh, it's told me I can be, it doesn't matter where I sit, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, location has become irrelevant. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of technology available which we were not using, mm -hmm. right? And I think we're using it today. Uh, it's not as if uh, you can totally do away do away with physical interactions forever. Uh, but I think the future is going to be somewhere between uh, what we were before the pandemic and where we are today. You know, mm -hmm. so we'll find the right hybrid between the physical and the virtual environment, and I think that will improve our productivity, uh, not only of us as individuals but of the space that we use the time that we spend and the resources that we spend in running our businesses. Mm -hmm. And I just want to turn now to the audience question. So we have some great questions coming in from Supriya and Ritu, and I'll just start with Ritu first. So Ritu, Ritu Jain is the uh, Chief Compliance Officer for General Electric in Asia, um, for Asia. And her question to you is, as CEO, has your expectations of the ethics and compliance function changed in the current times? Yeah, I think uh, uh, I wouldn't say in the current times. I think the bar keeps getting raised and we keep needing to recalibrate ourselves on what, uh, how we need to kind of uh, deal with the context which changes, right? So uh, so I wouldn't say uh, just the pandemic has made me change it, but uh, it's gr brought in greater consciousness on uh, employee welfare, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because we run factories, we have thousands of people, we have 70,000 people walking into our factories every day. And uh, how do you ensure that they go back, uh, you know, safe mm -hmm. in multiple ways? And I can say that our factories are safer than the communities in which they are living in. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a greater risk of infection out there, outside the factory than in the factory, wherever we operate. So that's a comfort that we need to build. So it, to me, it's far beyond compliance and far beyond what the law requires us to. It's, it's more about 
the moral compass that you set you set for yourself and the value system that you profess mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and also there's another one from miss supriya madan who's uh who's over at cbre and her question is at the executive management level what do you think are the key drivers of culture of integrity and if you can please highlight differences um if any from what compliance officers see or perceive so it kind of folds into into the last question um but more with a focus on culture of integrity so to me, compliance, etc., is a minimum condition, right? I mean, that's non-negotiable. But I think uh, value system is da created by much more than that, right? Uh, it's how you behave. Uh, it's a large number of small things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you walk the value system that you profess, right? And people watch you, particularly when you're leaders. You don't realize how closely people watch you, right? I mean, there may be something that you may have said without thinking much about it, but people take it... Uh, as something that you said after giving a lot of thought to it, right? So I think as leaders, uh, one has to be extremely careful. One should not underestimate the impact one could have, uh, you know, and so one needs to always be conscious of that, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, uh, because the behavior of the leader set the culture of the organization, it's, uh, you can have any number of stuff. I said it's important to codify, all that is important. Mm -hmm. uh, that is necessary, but not sufficient. Mm -hmm. You know, sufficiency check is uh, how do you behave uh, under stress? How do leaders behave day in and day out? And are they the role models uh, uh, that the value system, uh, you know, expects them to be? Yeah, and it, and it really comes back to being more proactive than reactive in those high stress situations. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's that's when it really comes out, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, if you say that I'm willing to lose a few million dollars, but I will not compromise on my value system, message is clear. Right. Mm -hmm. right? But if you say that, hey, let's find a way to, you know, be compliant, but, you know, save that million dollars, right. then you give a different message. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it just comes right back to codifying those practices. And Tata Sil has done an exceptional job at that um, during these times. So with that, Mr. Narendra, um, just want to thank you for lending your thoughts today. Um, that was truly exceptional. And I want to just make sure you get to your next meeting on time. Um, <laughs> so once again, to everyone on the line, that was Mr. TV Narendran, CEO and Managing Director of Tata Steel Limited. So thank you, Mr. Narendran, um, and I'll follow up with you via email. Sure. Thanks, Arti. Thank okay. you all.